Hello. So good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Please, uh, thanks very much for turning up at this early time. I think there's still some people coming in, but that shouldn't disturb us too much. My name is Paul Webb. I'm head of unit for budget and synergies with other programs at the Directorate General for Research and Innovation in the Commission. Uh, and I'll be the moderator today of this, of this panel on synergies. So for me, it's very obvious that research innovation in itself is not sufficient to deliver the sustainable future we want to, res to respond to the societal challenges. We need a whole range of different tools and policy action as well. It needs to start with research innovation, that's for sure. But if we want real impact, we've got to be integrated with the deployment of solutions and an effective policy framework. And it's important within the Commission, we've got to ensure effective, effective synergies within our own programmes, but also we have to work with member states, with regions and the private sector. And just this arrow that you can maybe see up on the board is our aim. You'll see this in the strategic plan that we've put forward, moving out from our own plan Synergies across the Commission, synergies in other policy areas, and out through the Member State actions. That's what we really want to achieve during the time of Horizon Europe. And it's about financing. Of course it's about financing. But it's also about so many other aspects of public policy. Source and organisation of finance needs to be an enabler. It's not the objective. And if you think that synergies is just about transfer of money between programmes, I hope you have changed your mind by the end of the session. Uh, the importance of the subject of synergies is why there's two sessions today. Uh, this session now and a session, I think, at 10.30 here uh, on uh, synergies with the regions. And they're going to be, that's why they're covered in depth in the strategic plan and they will be in the work programmes as well. So I want to ensure to make sure we've got an overall coherent approach in the EU to deliver on sustainability. Uh, I want you to be able to hear this morning about the different type of synergies that exist. They already exist, and what we want to do in the future, perhaps. And I've got some speakers here, five speakers. As you can see, their contact names were on the board, and we put them back up there. Two from the European Commission, one who's working as a member state representative, and two from research organisations to give you some different perspective on what's going on. So I hope that will challenge you, challenge me, uh, and inspire us as well in what we're doing. We need synergies to deliver our objectives. Uh, um, yeah, each one of them is going to have five minutes, a very strict five minutes, to set out what they want to, to tell us about the synergies. Uh, and then we can take some questions afterwards. Then after this session, my colleagues and I will go downstairs to Caban 21. We'll be there if anyone wants to talk to us. And also, in case you go to the other session, between 2 and 3 o'clock this afternoon, we'll also be at Caban 21, where we can discuss these things further. So without further delay, then we'll go on to the speakers. I'm going to start off with Romain Dubrava from DG Clima, DG Climate Action in the Commission. And I said no slides, but I've allowed him one slide, so we'll put that up on the board somewhere uh, for him to talk about the Innovation Fund, which he's responsible in DG Klima. So five minutes, Romain. Thank you, Paul. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's really a pleasure to be here. A very important topic. Uh, indeed, um, uh, also in view of uh, the debate that is now really ongoing all over the place about where Europe intends to go when it comes to fighting against climate change. And uh, as you know, our new uh, president-elect has set uh, an ambitious target on one hand side to reach the climate neutrality by 2050 and on the other also to speed up the change that is necessary on the ground already in the next decade. So that's why uh, I would uh, like to uh, uh, say a few words about the Innovation Fund and how does it link synergically with other programs and where we see the need to cooperate in order to deliver. So the Innovation Fund is the new instrument that comes uh, from the ETS, uh, Emissions Trading System. It is complementary instrument to the EU budget, so it is coming on top of the resources of Horizon Europe, for instance. And it will uh, provide funding 
to, let's say, the large part of the innovation chain, where we actually need to demonstrate working solutions to decarbonize our industry and our energy sector. So it will provide financing to projects that will deliver material greenhouse gas emissions avoidance while demonstrating technologies that are currently at the pre-commercial stage. So those technologies that cannot be financed on normal market conditions. So we are kind of coming uh, after, in one way, the, the Horizon Europe where you have your piloting, testing and development. And we are taking those technologies and drive them to the market. And we will try to ensure that there is a, a host of large-scale installations across Europe that will enable to reduce their costs and hence scale up those technologies across Europe uh, by 2030 and beyond. The Innovation Fund will uh, provide funding of uh, um, around 10 billion euros. This is uh, um, uh, after selling of 450 million allowances from the ETS sector. Uh, these resources will be uh, provided to projects across the decade by 2030, and we will support low carbon innovation in energy intensive industries, renewables, energy storage, and carbon capture and storage. So these are the sectors that the Innovation Fund will cover. Now, coming from the previous program that we had in NEA 300, uh, um, also from the ETS sector, and we have learned quite a lot about synergies there, because we have seen that many projects did not make it, essentially because their connection with other funding programs didn't work well. We also had a number of projects where it did. And we have seen that, for instance, especially large-scale, low-carbon technologies, when they need first the grant financing, in the later stages, when they will reach their financial close, they may need additional capital. So they used, for instance, enough in EDP facility where they uh, get access to long-term loans or equity finance. And this is essentially what we are trying to establish with Horizon Europe and with Innovation Fund, whereby we do not regulate what form of support the project will get. We will enable all sorts of funding products from grants through loans and equity. And it will be up to the project promoter to set up and structure and design their project accordingly. We are developing very strong links with our colleagues in DGRTD, especially the EIC, uh, the European Innovation Council, because we see a lot of synergies there, for instance, where you have a startup company that wants to develop a low-carbon uh, solution uh, at the early stage. This is where EIC comes in. And when this technology is piloted and tested, we are ready to take it in and allow additional funding when these projects are going to be scaled up on the market. Um, we also had uh, very uh, deep discussions in industry, uh, in all the sectors that we are covering with the Innovation Fund. And we have seen that there is quite a lot of projects already supported by Horizon Europe. And we will very much like to see them coming to the Innovation Fund for the next stage of their development and evolution and enable their demonstration on the ground. Uh, I will stop here because uh, Paul already signaled uh, I have uh, well, less than one minute. But there is a, this nice green paper in the back. You can take it. There are the links, uh, the website, the hashtag, whatever, where you can find more information about the Innovation Fund, more details about uh, the selection criteria, the conditions. We will launch the first call of the Innovation Fund already in mid next year. So we will kind of coming before the next MFF. And uh, then uh, we are ready to answer any of your questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's really the Innovation Fund and Horizon Europe. This is one of the great areas where you can see the synergies coming through. We can't do it without the synergies. They can't and we can't. It's fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we're going to put a Slido up now, aren't we? He says, looking uh, at the back. Anyway, we're going to try and put the Slido on where you can ask interactive questions. And I think there's even a poll on there that you can, uh, you can take uh, where we ask you about what do you think the most important thing are in synergies. Next, I've got Vesa Terava from uh, DG Connect, so Connected Europe in the European Commission. He's going to tell us a little bit about the links between Horizon Europe and the Digital Europe program. Vesa, five minutes. Thank you, Paul, and good morning, everybody. Actually, it's very uh, easy to continue after, after Roman uh, and, and uh, describe a little bit what a Digital Europe program is and uh, how Digital Europe 
program will work together with uh, Horizon Europe, but also other union programs like uh, Connecting Europe Facility and, and Structural Funds. Uh, Roman already mentioned that, uh, that our president-elect uh, uh, has highlighted uh, that the climate is one of the uh, priorities of the, of the uh, new commission. The other priority, uh, which is very prominent uh, if you read uh, the, the, the guidelines of president-elect, is digital. Uh, to uh, reinforce the European efforts to, uh, uh, um, to make digital transformation reality, uh, to, uh, to make sure that digital uh, is, uh, is used effectively across uh, all economic sectors and across the society. This is very important for, for Europe to uh, preserve its competitiveness and, and to make sure that we can, we can uh, respond uh, to uh, societal challenges, including, including, of course, climate change. Now, Digital Europe program, I feel when I talk about the program, it's still uh, somewhat unknown, uh, even if we have been discussing it already for, for more than a year. It's, of course, unknown because it's a new, new program uh, and, uh, and uh, of course, we need uh, to uh, make some effort to explain what actually it will bring on top of what the current programs and, and the continuation of, of the current programs will, will, will bring. So Digital Europe program uh, responds to the challenge that, that uh, we, uh, we have not been uh, very uh, good in Europe in bringing research and innovation in, into the market. And in particular, if we compare uh, uh, how our competitors, how, how in the US, in, in China, uh, the latest digital technologies uh, have been brought into market and, and uh, have been used to provide new services, uh, uh, we will have to make an extra effort in Europe to, to uh, keep the pace in this, in this race. So Digital Europe, ha it, on one side, it's capacity building. It's, uh, it's building capacities on high performance computing, artificial, in, and artificial intelligence, and cybersecurity, and make these capacities available uh, to businesses, uh, to public sector, to research community. So already there you see the, uh, see the uh, synergies uh, between Horizon and, uh, and uh, Digital Europe, for instance. Uh, investing in hyper-performance computing, of course, is important for our, our economies, but it's also important for our research community. And on the other side, investing further on, on high-performance computing, we still need research uh, and innovation efforts, for instance, in the area of microelectronics, so that we can build the next generation uh, uh, supercomputers, with, uh, hopefully, with the European uh, technology. Uh, the same goes, of course, for artificial intelligence and, and, and cyber. We have put um, already quite some effort uh, in the area of research and innovation in those areas, but, uh, but building uh, and those capacities and making them available, this is something where, where we are lacking, again, behind. So on artificial intelligence, we will invest on, on uh, making uh, data available uh, across the sectors, across the countries, in different areas, be it environmental data, be it mobility data, be it industrial data. And again, that data uh, should be available to, to our businesses, but also to our, our research community. Also, what, uh, what the program will do is invest in advanced digital skills. This is an area where really we have a challenge in, in, in Europe. Uh, companies uh, uh, have uh, really big difficulties in finding uh, uh, skilled people to use these latest technologies. So, uh, uh, so we, we will need to uh, invest uh, on, on, on skills. And then the last part, uh, last part is, is to make, once we have built the capacities, to make them uh, available to, to, uh, to, to the public uh, at large. So one element uh, of, of this part of the program is to, to build a network of digital innovation hubs, so that in, in our member states and in the, in the regions of our member states, the businesses will have access to the latest capaci capacities, be it uh, computing capacity, data, data processing capacity, or artificial uh, intelligent resources. And there we have the link with, uh, with, uh, with the structural funds. We 
with, uh, with Digital Euro program, we want to build the network of digital innovation hubs and, and connect them with, uh, with uh, excellent centers in, in, in the key technology areas. Of course, that is not enough. Uh, then then the, in, the, in the regions, uh, structural funds provide uh, a tool to make, make sure that uh, those innovation hubs serve for the local, uh, local community, business community. So I see from Paul that I will have to stop now. Thank you very much. <laughs> and thank you very much. No, I mean, with the digital world, as absolutely you can see the synergies there. And even in artificial intelligence, we've been having a lot of discussions about it. We need research, absolutely, but we also need a legal framework around it. You can't just think about the research. If we don't have a European legal framework, we, have, we run all sorts of dangers of differences between member states, but lack of protection of individuals as well. So there's a very, very big democratic question behind that, and uh, that's really important for us. Next up, Clara, who is a member state representative, in fact, on the research working party. So she's normally on the other side of the table criticising the commission. But she's also had an awful lot of experience in the ministry in Spain of trying to make sure that what we're doing in Europe is linked to what they're doing in Spain. So I hope that's what she's going to tell us about in her five minutes, please. Okay, thank you very much. Good morning. Thank you, Paul. And good morning to, to a lot of, to the audience in which I see a lot of familiar faces here, around here. So I can, I cannot tell you a very nice story uh, the nicest story as possible on synergies, uh, uh, because uh, I don't have the same experience. I don't have 10 billion uh, euros to spend uh, and to pour to create synergies. Uh, uh, we, what we, I can tell you, there are uh, the things that we have done. Those are small things, very small steps, and also the factors and the barriers that we have identified in the process of trying to create synergies. And I think that uh, through my intervention, I will try really to explain why this most important factor to develop effective synergies, which is coherent priorities, is very important. It's really on top of our priorities, but it's not enough. We need more than just uh, coherence uh, uh, between uh, uh, programs and, and activities. So first is, uh, I would like just to provide you the context of how we work on synergies uh, in Spain. First, uh, uh, like uh, Paul was saying uh, at the very beginning of the presentation, synergies is pretty much about funding and it's not only about funding. But I'm sorry, Paul, uh, from a member state's perspective, what we see as synergies first is just how combine uh, uh, funding from different sources and how just to create and maximize uh, 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 the, uh, to, to maximize the impact out of different uh, funding streams. And I learned that it's not enough. I know that it's not enough. Uh, but when you are right in the middle and you have to act, it's very difficult to stop and take a holistic perspective. So synergies uh, might be holistic conceptually, but um, in practical terms, uh, it means uh, 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 to deliver right on time uh, proper funding and to cover different uh, areas. The second thing uh, uh, that we did is related to the uh, scope and the area of intervention, how we create synergies. And it's true that synergies might be created all along the knowledge value change. But the most important niche or part of the value chain in which we might create synergies is near to the market. Mm? Ma demonstration and market deployment. And because there is a gap. And from our perspectives, synergies, uh, they have an important role to play by filling gaps. Mm? This is the second thing. The third uh, thing is that uh, we work and we identify synergies uh, across two different dimensions. First, what we call vertical synergies. 
in main synergies between uh, uh, European and national programs uh, and synergies between national and regional programs. Uh, this is our vertical dimension, but also, in particular in Spain, uh, we have a problem, and I think this is something that we are discussing in those days here at the level of, of the Commission. They are horizontal synergies as well. This is synergies between different departments within the same administration level, and it's very important to overcome the barriers, the limits, and the silo type of a, a, a policy work. Just one minute? Yes. Okay, so this is what we did. And in practical terms, sorry. Um, mm, in practical, in practical terms, uh, we supported different projects that were awarded, uh, uh, well, collaborative projects uh, uh, from FP7, uh, and uh, that have a kind of uh, additional complementary needs to really uh, 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 complete the full cycle uh, for demonstration and so on. They're pretty much on the energy uh, area. So those, those are the, the, the projects that have uh, a, lot of, a lot of potential. We have for that what we did, well, the funding uh, uh, type uh, that we use is, uh, we use national funds, we use at national level uh, financial instruments, and we combine them with uh, structural funds. But there are a lot of limitations when you try to become really effective and to, to put that in place. Okay. Uh, starting, and this is something that I want to mention, it's yeah. very important, yes, uh, to, cre to create synergies in action. It's very important to have a common L set of eligibility criteria. Mm. Mm. Uh, okay. uh, for beneficiaries, costs, and yeah. so on. Okay. And uh, I don't know if I can continue because no, they, they, no. they are a lot no, of aspects. No. <laughs> okay, that's good. No, I, I said at the beginning, it's not about financing, but of course the member states will always tell me, yes, it is, yes, it is, it's very, very important. You can't do it without the financing. It's true, it's true. But the financing needs to be the tools, not the objective. That's, that's absolutely right. And, uh, there are different ideas. You, there is on Slido, the poll that we have is on the screen, in fact, where we've given you 10 or 12 options and asked you to choose what you think are the five most important. But maybe, Yael, we can try and move it on, on the screen. We could have the question, uh, the question area, the area where people can write questions. Can you put that up there? OK. All right, uh, you were talking about energy, and energy is an area that certainly we need a lot of investment as well as research, and that's uh, very interesting. And next we have Berta Matas, who is, works for Sintef, uh, which is the Norwegian funding agency, and she's re research and technology organization. Yeah, uh, They do do a bit of funding, but they're basically the research and technology organization in Norway. Uh, and she is a senior researcher in the energy area. So you can tell us in five minutes the sort of things that you've seen on energy. Yes, sure. Thank you, Paul, and thanks for the invitation. Good morning to everyone. Um, so as uh, Paul said, as a researcher from uh, the energy field, I would like to pick up a topic that's been a bit controversial. Some people think it could potentially be defined as a success story. Some others are a bit more uh, skeptical to that, and that's the strategic energy technology plan. Um, I would like to start saying that um, at least what we could already say right now, because the set plan is still in the process of being implemented and realized, so that's an additional element to say a potential success story. Uh, what we can say is that at least it has already helped us to come up with a common energy policy. And without that, we would certainly have a more much diverse, uh, let's say, um, interest in terms of energy policy there, at least with regards to the uh, mobilization of the research community. And if we think about this, uh, one of the commitments of the new president of the commission, uh, meaning that uh, Europe should become the first uh, continent being uh, climate neutral, we could maybe see the set plan as a platform to contribute to that. Now, um, I would like to say that probably the main efforts that have been done on the field of the set plan so far, and that certainly contribute to synergies, in my view, 
are um, the alignment of uh, research and innovation strategic agendas across European countries. Um, and not only with involvement of the research community, which also, but in particular with involvement of member states and associated countries, which have been leading this process, and that's very important in order to have ownership of this process, but also with industrial players. So again, if we take this triangle, uh, knowledge triangle, we could see that the three main pillars have been involved into that. Um, Representing the research community, say, then I would say that uh, there is this uh, European Energy Research Alliance that some of you may know that has had certainly a key role in contributing to this head plan, being one of the research pillars of this head plan. And in particular, uh, there's been quite some effort done in trying to align at least the research community towards uh, common goals for different energy fields. So I would say that this is, at least up to the definition, a success story. Um, and we have also experienced through ERA that there's some mechanisms already out there that has helped to do that. Um, we could then pick up one of them as example, that would be the combination of national and European funding to, let's say, use existing national projects and try to top those existing national projects with European funding that could, let's say, bridge the gaps that those national projects are, per today, not covering. But it's not just uh, roses and everything good stories, as Clara said. Uh, we have also identified some challenges that are still uh, making the set plan sometimes uh, complicated. Um, if I focus first on the EU side, I would maybe say that there's just too many and too complex instruments to create synergies. So we need to be able to simplify all that. And maybe instead of creating even new instruments, we should just try to revise and eventually develop the existing ones and try to see whether we can make something out of it. And from the member state associated county uh, side, um, sometimes the frustration from the research community is that the budgets, the national budgets that are allocated to create these cross-border synergies are just too low and possibly lack flexibility. Um, so there are some priorities of issues we could do in the future. Um, we need to simplify and make more flexible all these um, possible mechanisms for creating synergies. The mission-oriented approach that has been now on the table, uh, in my view, is a way, a strong way to contribute to that. We are then very targeted. It provides flexibility. Uh, it also provides inclusiveness. So that should be able to, uh, to uh, let's say, make things hopefully a bit easier. We need political commitment. We need political commitment, not just from the EU side, but also from the member state side. Um, and we also need to be probably better in coordinating ourselves inside the countries and even inside the organizations, start thinking across each other. Synergies should start uh, with our own homework. At my own organization, Sintef, we have already started to uh, define priority areas that indeed have a rather mission-oriented approach rather than vertical approaches. Um, so with that, I think I will stop just giving some, uh, let's say, uh, hope that things can actually turn out better. Thank you very much. Uh, the set plan is a great effort at making synergies. I don't say it's working well enough, but at least the, the intention was there. The energy area is very important. And missions should be an area where synergies are built in. Absolutely built in from the start. You don't even have to think about what are the synergies going to be? They have to be there at the start. It will never work, I think. So our last speaker, Julius Schmalenberg from uh, Fraunhofer in Germany, is also uh, in the research field and talking, uh, do, talking a lot about technology transfer and startups and so on. So please, uh, give us your five minutes. Thank you, Paul. So uh, thanks uh, that I can be here. And I was asked to give a view from the outside. And I'm very happy to do that. Uh, Fraunhofer Gesellschaft is the largest organization for applied research in Europe. We have 25 or more than 25,000 people working in 72 institutes that are spread over Germany and some other areas in the world in Europe. So in these 70 years, we, of course, um, 
gathered some experience in how to do innovation. And uh, here I want to start with the biggest success as uh, I see it at the moment. This is that the networked innovation principle I see um, really increased over time and the knowledge triangle to integrate that. So Fraunhofer is integrating that knowledge triangle per definition. We, our business model is uh, one third base funding from the government, which we use to um, build infrastructure and maintain infrastructure that is used for piloting and testing. And also to do foresight uh, ourselves and look at the most important technologies for the next years for industry, because this is our mission. We have to disseminate state-of-the-art technology into SMEs and industry all over. That is the mission of Fraunhofer. And that is also where we want to be with Europe. So it's, we, we want to get somewhere. We want to see what we do on the market. And uh, things have a bit changed over the years and in the last decades. And that is where I want to come to the biggest challenge that I see. And that is understanding the uh, innovation process when it um, goes to deep tech innovation. Because that is not easy and it's not linear and it's not, you cannot foresee it and you cannot define it because so many factors play a role. Which means that um, when you look from what's coming out of the lab, you have to look at where you can apply it. And that is not always clear and that is usually more than one sector and more than one areas and you don't see it right from the start. So you need to test it and you need to ask industry to do that with you and to join forces to see how that technology can be applied in the best way. And over the years, the, the innovations that we see coming, the potential innovations, are having more impact on industry because usually it's getting to a, a huge structural change. And that is why we see also industry being a bit reluctant to buy in early on because they don't see the benefit, they don't know whether they can use it. And there where we see also European collaborative innovation becoming more important because so many things only work on a European level anymore. If you think about energy especially, I mean, you don't have to start nationally or locally. It doesn't make sense. And there's many more examples. Also with the Industry 4.0, uh, advanced manufacturing, AI, we, we don't have to start locally. So the understanding of the deep tech innovation process is important. You need to test it, you need to put resources into it, try in different application areas where it fits, and then let it just boost into the market. So the priority for me is that you break the silos, yep. and of course it's about funding also, so in, in the different stages yep. of innovation you always look to different boxes where you can get the money out. For, for us it's different, for us it's a continuous process, we have a technologies, we, we acquire the, the knowledge about the technologies, we mature the technologies in different application areas, and then we want to just have industry using it. So please just look at the process as a continuous thing and try to build a framework that just facilitates our work and accelerates. That'd be great. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, I did say I wouldn't censor anyone who came on the panel, so uh, you, uh, <laughs> and you've heard that that's true. And I see, when I look at the questions now that are on the board, about half are just purely about financing, financing rules, and half are a little bit wider. And I think that probably reflects people's positions and the challenges that we're facing. Good, so I have. Um, what they've done, they've given me here, apparently this is a microphone that we can throw about, it's very soft, so we can get to the end of rows. Is there anyone who might like to ask a question at this point? I see somebody here. Um, if you have a question for a particular person, please say. Otherwise, either I'll decide who answers or they will decide themselves. Please, if you could just introduce yourself very, very briefly as well. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Craig Nicholson from Research Europe. Um, my question's about state aid. Mm -hmm. um, I know that there are problems with state aid rules, even um, trying to transfer, say, 
applications from the ERC using the seal of excellence didn't really work because of state aid, I'm told. So I imagine those problems are worse when it comes to closer to market uh, projects, but is that true? Do you see problems there and what are the solutions? So I can tell you that the in, in state aid there is uh, currently review of the state aid going on. It's in uh, stakeholder consultation which will absolutely simplify things for the seal of excellence question. So I think that should be resolved. But in the bigger question, please, yes. Okay. Um, I fully agree. That's one of our major problems, okay? And because uh, of state aid, uh, this full uh, 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 link of full synergies between European and, and member states' uh, funds and activities cannot be really achieved. Uh, and by the way, it's true that uh, there is a kind of revision hmm, and, uh, of, of the state aid uh, rules will be uh, not enough to achieve full synergies and uh, still uh, uh, the Commission needs uh, to go uh, uh, back again to, to see how it might work. But it's really one of our major problems at the level of member states. But the state aid framework is not just for research. Eh? The state aid framework is there for a very good reason. Uh, it may be inconvenient sometimes, but that doesn't necessarily make it bad. Uh, anyone else who'd like the... Uh... Miroslav has already asked the question. Okay, I'll have a look at those in a minute. Let's just uh, come over here. Please, can I throw it to you? Hi, yeah, Duncan Halley, uh, Norwegian Institute for Nature Research. I'm here because of the word sustainability. I've hardly heard it said since we got in here. Am I wasting my time? Okay, you don't think talking about energy research is about sustainability? Or you wanted to hear the key word? It's <laughs> Any thoughts, anyone? Yeah. Well, so I'm not sure I kind of understood the question, but it, so the word sustainability is obviously important across any of the elements in my understanding that we are facing today, both in terms of obviously the science behind, but also uh, in terms of mechanisms, and they need to be sustainable. And actually one of the points of why we are today bringing the challenges and the priorities uh, for the future is because we want those elements to be sustainable. So in my understanding, for example, when I'm saying that there is too little national budget for creating uh, cross-border synergies, this is a way to say that the system at the moment is not sustainable, at least to make these things happen. So in my understanding, this word sustainability that maybe was not explicitly mentioned is actually across all the interventions uh, today. I'm not sure if any of the colleagues have any other uh, just to add, probably from the environmental sustainability point of view, uh, you know the whole set of new rules are being established, uh, from uh, the sustainability tracking to carbon proofing uh, of of the infrastructure. So I think this is something that is already being quite well embedded in the system, and uh, you know essentially with uh, the objective of a carbon neutral Europe by 2050. Um, I think this is a, a new. Uh, a field which will be very strongly embedded in all policies that are coming up. Okay. So we had a lot of questions on the Slido about funding rules. Uh, very many of you frustrated about the different funding rules. I don't know who asked us. Yeah, I've seen a few people nodding there. Uh, certainly something we're aware of, certainly something we're working on. My colleagues over here, he was there a little bit earlier. Um, who's dealing with the structural fund rules as well, trying to make sure we have one set of rules, one common set of funding rules. But of course, we know that the structural funds are almost also famous for their gold plating, where each member state decides they want to have different rules in, uh, in those areas. Also comments about CEF, how do we get synergies with CEF? That's certainly something that uh, I have to personally work on. Somebody asking about the LIFE program. Yes, we have certain links with the LIFE program. Maybe it's not enough, but uh, there are certainly, we will get closer to them. Uh, somebody over here, please. Let us know who you are. Hello, please. I'm Sofia Papadoniado, and I work at INEA in Seth. And uh, I think there is a, maybe a kind of misunderstanding on how we work in Seth in relation to research and innovation. 
First of all, we don't finance research under CEF, so it's to be clear. We do have a priority which is called innovation, and the idea is uh, indeed to introduce new technologies in the implementation programs. So in uh, eligible research is not eligible under CEF. Uh, this is to be cleared. What we are trying to do is indeed to promote synergies between the re results that we have from uh, Horizon Transport, so mature projects that they have a level of maturity enough and have demonstrated the results to be uh, introduced through, of course, our potential okay. beneficiaries quickly, quickly, to uh, big implementation programs. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. This, uh I don't want to hear too much from the Commission, but uh, no, with CEF we have some work to do, we know that. We know we have some better work to do with CEF, but uh, it's absolutely an area where the synergies are very clear and very, very key, so uh, there's that. Anybody else would like to ask a question at the moment? Come on, there's lots of criticism on the board, nobody want to say, want to say anything? Let me have a look. Uh, synergies affect Horizon Europe, will associated countries be in disadvantage? I don't think so. Um, but uh, that we'll have to see. Here's a nice question. Can the SDGs help provide a framework for synergies to make connections outside their silos? What do you think? Maybe, Roman, you can just uh, answer that. The SDGs, how we're working with that. Uh, do you mean this, the breaking the silos? Yeah, um, does it help, do you think, I mean, the commission? I think it's happening as we speak. Yeah. Uh, uh, just look around the proposals for the new MFF. Um, uh, I can uh, kind of con um, uh, say from the innovation point of view that um, uh, we are trying to establish the support exactly to follow the value chain or innovation chain that starts with idea, with potentially different people, and ends with a real installation with probably different people, but and a different objective. But the, but our key uh, objective is to ensure that there is a seamless support across that chain. And I think this is really happening. So I wouldn't be that critical. I think we are trying really to establish a framework that nurtures that uh, um, uh, movement along the value chain from idea to the real, real investment. Anyone else? Any thoughts on SDGs? Julia, yeah. I think SDGs always provide a, a goal and an objective, and that is, of course, easier to um, put all the players in, in place that they, they cre uh, to create synergies. I mean, you need a common objective, and then to join forces, you will automatically have synergies. So uh, also the mission-oriented approach can help in that way, how you then, in essence, frame it uh, concretely. Yeah. That's another thing. But yeah. to just run into the same direction, that already helps a lot. If I may add something, as in general terms, uh, synergies uh, are very effective when you have clear targets. So if you create synergies without those clear targets, the probability yeah. of failure is yeah. very high. But, yeah. yeah, and maybe, maybe the bringing the element that, so for those of you that participated in the session where Mariana Maxucato and, and uh, Muedes were part of discussing the missions, one of the elements, and then bringing a bit the ball back to the member states, is that Marianne mentioned that, well, in terms of missions, they are also relying a lot on the efforts that member states will do to contribute to those missions that uh, are already defined, the five missions, but will need in a bottom-up way to be, let's say, defined in a bit more detail. So in this respect, I see that as a huge opportunity to also align national let's say, um, interest uh, through these missions, and we could see then the Sustainable Development Goals as a way to also uh, contribute to targeted uh, mission-oriented approaches. Now, I must say, as, as a Commission official, uh, I don't know if you feel the same, but the SDGs has really been a great introduction to force us to work together. Really, I, I really do feel that, and I, I don't know, Roman, I think you probably look at the same. It's really, for me, has forced us to look again at what we're doing and to put ourselves into question and why we're not working with other people. And to that extent, it's been very, very helpful. I know it's, it's complicated and all the indicators and things like that, but it's been absolutely wonderful for me to really say to us, stop arguing amongst yourselves. Here's really something that is so important for the world. So I, I really feel it. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Anyone else?
still lots of questions on funding rules. I, I, I take note. I mean, it is our absolute intention to simplify funding rules. We will, probably not to your full satisfaction, but hopefully at least to, uh, to some of your satisfaction. Um, European Defence Fund. I mean, we come to, maybe better to come to, back to that as a um, bilateral issues, and we can think about that a bit more. Any question around the room? Yeah, please, let me... Can you take that to gentlemen? Thank you. Hello. Um, so my question is really around synergies related to sector coupling. There's a lot of great opportunities coming up with Horizon Europe, and um, I think there could be um, much more developments in strategy for synergies between funding in one area and funding in another area, but coming together for, yeah. for the common good. I'm thinking about energy production, low yeah. carbon energy production, yeah. but then also could be coupled with the transport sector for hydrogen production, for, uh, or even desalination for water resources that could be funded elsewhere. So, but it should all really come together in one common strategy. So, synergies for sector coupling. Yeah. That's very good. Nothing about financing. That's great. But um, I, I hope that the strategic planning process, I hope that Horizon Europe will do that. I really hope that the mission will do that because if we can't do that, I mean, we're, we're going nowhere. This should be the minimum. Absolutely should be the minimum. And I hope that when you look at Horizon Europe and when you see the strategic plan, uh, you, you'll see that. I mean, it seems to me to be in there, but it's absolutely essential. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Anyone else want to ask a question at the moment? We have about 15 minutes uh, if anyone wants to take that opportunity. Yes, please, I have a question down here, if you could bring this to the... Hi, good morning, Doris Alexander, Trinity College, Dublin. I mean, one of the things we've spoken about here today is synergies between different types of, uh, of uh, funding instruments, such as Horizon, such as the Innovation Fund, such as structural funds. To get synergy between member state and EU funding, you actually need the buy-in of member states to reorient their priorities to a European set of priorities. And if you said yourself, structural funds tend to be gold-plated and people tend to do with them at a national level, what the government at a national level wants to do. Yep. So what can we do to incentivise national governments to link into European priorities yeah. to allow things like the missions to actually um, um, be facilitated? So I think, well, the missions is one thing, but I think the strategic planning is another. And I had a d uh, discussion with Per from um, Sweden, if he's, if he's somewhere in the room. Yeah, that's right. And his next job is to come up with a research and innovation strategy for Sweden. And he was asking me, how can we put this together with the EU priorities? And I thought, this is what a fantastic question. Uh, and what a fantastic challenge. So, I mean, he is trying to do it. And I think everybody should be trying to do it. And I think that is what the strategic planning process and the involvement of member states should be all about. But I don't know if, Peer, you want to just say that very quickly. And then maybe Clara could uh, say something as well. Getting people who weren't even on the panel to speak. Thank you very much. Yes, I'm the Swedish research attaché uh, at the Swedish Prime Rep. Um, and uh, we will prepare a research and innovation bill next for next autumn to be presented to the to the Parliament. Okay, I restart. Um, so for next uh, next autumn, we will present the Swedish uh, research and innovation bill to the to the Parliament. And uh, of course, as I've been negotiating now the Horizon Europe program, uh, we are thinking about how to to create synergies on the between the national level and the European level, and how we can uh, adapt what we do uh, on the national level to to connect to the European level. Uh, so um, that's basically what we want to, to achieve. So. so there's a good example. And Clara, you're in a member state. Tell us what you're doing. It works? Yeah. OK. So what I, I, I can tell you is that uh, we have the experience uh, in the previous Spanish strategy for, for research uh, and innovation that uh, was uh, um, uh, is, is dated in, in 2013 hmm, and is still running. Uh, our experience is that we might align uh, the priorities. That's not the difficult part. 
uh, different actors and our actors are all really integrated into European networks and global networks. So our stakeholders, and if you work with the stakeholders, you will uh, converge uh, uh, and just uh, uh, create a coherent uh, uh, vision in terms of policies and policy targets. This is one thing. Uh, what is very difficult from my experience is the implementation. So once you find that you have a common set of goals mm, and convergence, uh, you might also work in, in terms of instruments. Uh, this is uh, 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 how I see uh, that we might yes, uh, get a big uh, a step forward if we were synergistically, because our instruments and instruments from the European uh, Commission and the instruments from member states, they have to be aligned from a different perspective. Okay. And finally, uh, still, even if we have the instruments, uh, there are still uh, some other elements uh, uh, con concerning specific design criteria and so on that are very important in, during the implementation. And that's why I always said that policy is very important, but okay. implementation is more. Good. Well, Julia, how does it look in Germany? Do you see any alignment, EC, national programs? Yes. I do. <laughs> There's, uh, of course, alignment. And uh, I think every country in Europe knows that there are things that we have to tackle jointly. Yeah. How we tackle that and who gets what is the fight. And uh, at the moment, I think we are not there yet that we really are totally collaborating and thinking, OK, now, and I heard yesterday, you know, collaborating is first being generous and then buying in, and then you will have the synergies, and yeah. then something comes out of that. Yeah. And everyone has to give something first, and... Yes, that's for sure. The member states have to do okay. that also. Uh, maybe one comment from my side. Obviously, alignment of priorities is important for, for any uh, funding program, but it's, it's uh, a necessity for deployment programs like like digital euro program which uh, the whole idea is that, that that we can build only the capacities uh, digital capacities if we pool resources together uh, uh, the e at the EU level and together with member states and if we don't have aligned uh, objectives aligned targets this will never happen so it's very important the way we try to do it, we've been trying to do it uh, in the areas of Digital Europe program. There's, of course, the policy discussion already, like like the importance of uh, of uh, supercomputing, the, 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 the importance of, uh, of uh, investing in artificial intelligence. There's a whole lot of, of, of policy debate going on, and that, we believe, uh, contributes to setting the, the common, common targets and then facilitates pooling resources together when we actually implement the program. Okay, Berta, you're yeah. representing them in, from, a, from a small, from a smallish country. Small so does it look? <laughs> Actually, I would like to share, uh, I would say a success story that we have in Norway that could be, I think, extended to the European uh, dimension. And those are these so-called centers of excellence, which involve the research community, also the government um, through the Research Council and it's industry. And so uh, in this kind of centers of excellence that oh, usually are virtual, level. but include them and key players from the country uh, that are have expertise in a dedicated field, they join forces to align already at national level. Now, one suggestion could be, could we try to coordinate national centers of excellence across Europe based on already existing national efforts where then the alignment is per se kind of natural and integrated without the need to really build up or create new instruments from the commission side where the, mainly the European side would make be, as I said earlier, bridging the gaps of the okay. already existing national Good. initiatives. Preferably no new instruments at European Union level. I, I, I think that's the message we're getting. Please. 
Last couple of questions now. Yes. Good morning. My name is Patrice Buchholz from Innovation Policy Matters. Um, when we started Horizon 2020 and uh, thinking about synergies with structural funds, uh, the key message was smart specialization strategies for regions. And I think one of the key messages was there, you know, we shouldn't all be trying to do the same. We should develop our strategies that fits with your regional capacity and so forth and so forth. Um, I have the impression that we are now completely forgetting that and we're all trying to go for the same things again. Uh, every Everyone going for the same missions, going for the uh, sustainable development goals. Um, how can we um, say, uh, bring those two things together, the, the, the speciality of each region and, and, and part of Europe with the you know, sort of uh, the common vision where we go next. I, I think there's a tension there and, and, yeah. and we haven't still figured yeah. out how to deal with that. Okay. Can I just take the, the there was just two more questions. We'll take those now and we'll just, we'll just wrap that up because we've got to finish uh, in a few minutes. But thank you, it's a, it's a good point then. Eh? Yeah, hello, uh, Lucie Du Rocher from the region Sud Provence Alpes Côte d'Azur in France. Uh, one question about communication, because I guess that better communication on the outcomes of Horizon 2020 or future Horizon Europe projects could help with challenges. For example, we could think that um, if authorities managing uh, structural funds could have more information about the results of Horizon yeah. Europe project, it could yeah. help them thinking about ways to support the uptake of these results. I don't know. Absolutely right. No, dissemination and exploitation is absolutely essential to synergies. Absolutely. Um, and um, the gentleman over here, and then we have to stop with the questions, I think. But no, absolutely right. We have to do that. Hi, it's Santi Reyo from La Paz University Hospital. Uh, I uh, want to stress also that uh, there is uh, alignment that does not mean uh, replicating the priorities to each level. Uh, yeah. I want to see in the, in the synergistic approach a complementarity because the, yeah. the situation at, at the different levels, regional, uh, national, are not always the same. And sometimes you feel that all the topics, all the funds, all the interests are the same. And say, yeah, uh, I'm okay. Coming back to your question. Yeah, okay. Yes, I think we're, as terminology, certainly we need to be careful. Any last comments from anybody here? Because we've got to wrap up in, the, in a few minutes. Okay, looking at these questions and, uh, and at the poll, I think for about half the questions are about funding rules. You're very frustrated about funding rules, the differences in funding rules. Even small differences can make big differences in the way that you're doing it. I take that to my heart. Uh, I, we know we have to do something. We will do something. We will improve the situation, as I say, perhaps not to your total satisfaction, but uh, certainly you will see that there will be much more simplified possibilities to transfer funding around there. I take it as well. I don't like to talk about funding because I think it's, it's, it's a distraction from the main objective, but for at least half of you and for you up here as well, funding is you cannot separate synergies and financing. It's absolutely got to be integrated in there. That's something that I have to learn myself as well. Uh, quite a number of comments that I've seen on here about y your frustration with all the different programs. Do we have too many programs? Do we not have too many programs? Well, that's an open question. I can't decide myself. But what I know is we have to make sure they work together. The CEF, I think we, we take the point. We, we have, there is a lot of work done with CEF already. I know that. We can do it better. Innovation Fund, we're already doing a number of things. We can do it better. Digital Europe. Uh, with DG Connect, we're really integrated at the moment, and I really hope that goes on well. Uh, Life program as well. We have Life is a very really national program, as Horizon Europe is a is, is a European wide program. Of course, they have different target audiences, but we are working with them to make sure that they're using our results. Uh, absolutely, dissemination and exploitation of research results is is critical for this. We can't do it without it. It's one important stream of the things that we have to do for synergies. The first one is the governance structure, using the strategic plan as well to make sure it happens at a high level. We need the dissemination exploitation strategy, knowledge management basically. Communication and knowledge management has to be a second one. The third one is about deployment. How do we give ourselves the best opportunity of taking up the results? And the fourth one is probably financing, which uh, say we can do talk everything we all we like, but as the Irish representative always tells me at the uh, European Council meetings, you can't do anything without financing. 
Uh, I think we're about to, oh, he's given me two minute, the two minute warning. So uh, thank you very much to the panelists. I mean, I've learned a lot. My colleagues over there have no doubt made, uh, made some notes. What's going to happen now? At 10.30, there is the seminar on synergies, regions in the lead, which is really about what the structural funds are doing and how they've developed it. Me and my colleagues and maybe a few of the speakers will be downstairs at Caban 21 in a few minutes. We'll also be there between 2 and 3 o'clock for anyone who's going to the next session. If anyone would like to take my business card and contact me later about something, please come and do that. Uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you very, very much. Thank you to the speakers. Thank you.